So this is the webinar for the MSc Research for International Development. I'm going to take you uh, through a few key points about SOAS, the approach of the degree, and then uh, give you a taste of the kind of uh, issues and themes that you will be exposed to uh, if you were to take this MSc. So welcome, first of all, you are here either as you have an offer, so as prospective students, or whether you are interested in considering applying for this MSc. And just to start, SOAS is easily one of the world's most diverse and exciting campuses, and you will be here with us for one year of what is a very intensive learning experience, uh, working with the, the most international uh, campus and set of uh, both staff and students uh, across the world. Uh, we are, of course, in London that offers a lot of opportunities. And uh, we are very confident that when you come, we will be very important moment in your intellectual life because you will be stimulated to very important inputs about the nature of development and what can be done about it in the world. Uh, the MSc Research International Development is an interdisciplinary degree that is uh, the only one of our degrees that is funded by the Economic and Social Research Council, which is um, the, 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 the public sector, the British government body that looks after research in, international, in, uh, in, uh, in social sciences. And with their funding, they give a kind of seal of quality approval to the nature of this program. That is very exciting because it's uh, interdisciplinary and it teaches you three main things. First of all, research methods. You will be training in research methods through the lenses of the main debates uh, and topic in international development. And it also trains you to understand the link between these two dimensions because a key argument we make is that uh, the, the, the conclusion and different positions that different organizations or scholars take when it comes to development programs, like why are some countries rich and some countries poor? Why is uh, work so precarious and uh, uh, lowly remunerated in developing countries? Uh, these different positions on these questions rest on different value, politics, and assumptions that researchers or institutions make, and that influence their choices of research questions and research methods that they adopt when they jet and collect evidence about development debates. So training in research methods is central to the three core or compulsory courses that you take for this degree. Uh, the first one is called uh, Research Methods in International Development. It runs in term one and there is an introduction to the fundamentals of research methods uh, how do you design research? How do you set your research questions? What are uh, uh, the main uh, research design issues and the main type of evidence, qualitative and quantitative research, that you might deploy when working as a researcher in international development? The second core course is called Statistical Research Techniques in International Development. It runs in term two. And it is about learning uh, the nuts and bolts of uh, statistical research techniques. And uh, also very importantly, to read critically statistics about uh, development. Often one reads uh, very uh, critically numbers about a certain issue. So X percent of children are malnourished. Then we teach you how many choices can you do when you create these statistics and numbers about a certain issue. And then the third core course is called Battlefields of Methods, Approaches to International Development Research. So while well, the first and the second one uh, courses are about understanding and learning the fundamentals of research design of qualitative research and quantitative research, the core course called Battlefields of Methods is about saying there is more to research methods than to be able to know how you use a certain technique. Research methods are also, and perhaps more importantly, about politics, the politics of researchers, the politics of uh, interests and agendas that they have, uh, the politics of uh, the position of a researcher within a field of colleagues with different values and politics. So we will show 
how politics frame research methods by introducing the connection between politics and methods and then seven case studies each lasting two weeks that explore a certain theme or topic in development for instance microcredit and then explore a clash a political battle between two different approaches to uh, the same topic for instance is microcredit the solution to poverty er eradication or is this a problem uh, because it is misleadingly celebrated as a good solution to poverty eradication so we call it battlefields of methods because we select case studies where you see researchers all trained in research methods taking very diverse and different and contrasting approaches to the same issue trying to tease out what are the politics of this and what do you do to navigate the evidence when the the, the debate is really fairly heavily politically charged and the course is, uh, you know, our teaching uh, takes place in two ways, either a one hour lecture followed by a one hour tutorial with 12 students per tutorial group or a two hour seminar, which is what Battlefields of Method takes as a route. In this case, you have a, a two hour interactive seminar where about 50 percent of the time is uh, led from me or other teachers. And the other half is about coursework activity, group work, uh, question and answer sessions. In addition to core courses, you will take uh, four optional courses. Uh, most of them are taught over one term. You can choose according to your thematic or regional interest, and then there is a dissertation. Uh, the assessments vary across courses. There are essays, there are book reviews, there are policy briefs, there are exams, there are single present individual presentation or group presentations, and uh, we have uh, materials to help students to familiarize with what is expected of each assignment. And on top of that, we provide students with uh, office hours or academic advice slots where you get the academic advice before you write your assignments and also feedback once your assignment are returned and marked. Battlefields of Method is a taught by a team, while the other two core courses and most options in general are taught by a single lecture. When we talk about the teaching team, first and foremost, full-time members of SOA staff, together with senior PhD researcher or postdoctoral researchers who tend to hold the tutorial, the small group discussion uh, in the core courses or uh, in some of the options. Now, in terms of prior requirements, you will know that international development and development studies are, by definition, a multidisciplinary uh, social science field. Uh, and you uh, will be eased into the degree if you have prior degrees in this field, but there are every year several students who come from either uh, maths, physics, doing a, a, an academic career change, or from uh, literature languages. So I think what is realistic to expect, and this is perhaps what has made you interested in, in this degree in the first place, is that you have an interest in uh, ongoing developments in the world, some basic understanding of world histories, and in particular the history of Asia, Africa, and Latin America. In terms of quantity of work, for each course, you will read approximately 60 pages per course per week. Uh, and there might be on top of that some newspaper or agency report that you can uh, read to understand this topic further. Um, frequently asked question is, do I need to read before coming to us? We say the real learning starts when you come, but for the who are anxious to get going and uh, do some of this preliminary groundwork, there are uh, preliminary readings that are uploaded on the web, and so is a case of seeing what's out there right now and uh, check later over in the summer for more readings if you are uh, coming to source. us. Now, it's very likely that you are looking 
uh, possible options for your degree. So what is specific about SOAS development studies and what is different from other degrees in development studies? Uh, first of all, we are a world leading department. We are consistently in the top 10 in the world and in the latest the QS World University ranking exercises in 2020, we were ranked as sixth in the world. And uh, together with the world leading excellence of our work, the, the brand of source development studies is famous for its critical approach to the study of development. So you might be asking yourself, what does critical development studies really mean? It's about understanding how mainstream agendas of development, the one held by the World Bank, by the IMF, that are the key bilateral uh, uh, players, we look at how they are created, whether they work or not, and how power and relations of power affect who decides what the development agenda is. And we also consider the theoretical roots of different approaches to development. So, for instance, you ask yourself, how is the economy to be run? Are labor regulations good or bad for development? Is industrialization essential for development? And then we look at the, uh, the roots in theory of different uh, policy and practical uh, approaches. Of course, um, it would be difficult to uh, avoid any mention to the current situation that has me uh, speaking from uh, home, and you uh, likely listening to this uh, from home, and that is the coronavirus emergency, which of course has uh, uh, the, 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 the shift uh, uh, or at least considering the possibility if uh, campus learn degrees were forbidden in September due to the crisis to consider online or blended learning. So there are possibilities of doing the so-called blended learning in which you uh, combine on-campus studying with some distance learning and these are the, the five courses that have been add this part of this blended learning strategy, or we offer two online degrees. One is the MSc International Development, and the other one is the MSc Humanitarian Action. Now, we I'm going to spend a few minutes uh, giving you a taster of our teaching, and that would be to think about uh, uh, the, the battlefields of methods through the case study of researching cities, urban life, and trying to explore the theory, assumption, and research methods nexus and how it affects the type of stories and the work that different researchers uh, tend to put forward when they study cities. So the obvious point is that the rapid and sustained growth of cities and in particular the urbanization of the planet is a key feature of our time. In 2014, there was a milestone where 54% of the world population became urban. So this is a picture of the world in uh, 1950s. You can see that uh, in red on the right of the screen. I'll, I'll use the pointer. Can you see? Yeah. Uh, in red on the right, there are the mega cities, very few of them in the south. And then orange, yellow is about slowing um, uh, uh, lower number of uh, inhabitants. So orange is cities with five to 10 million inhabitants. Yellow is one to five and going down and down as we go left towards the screen. And uh, you can see a very little of the world population was living in red areas, 0.9%, while the majority of the uh, planet was gray, which is rural. Now, fast forward this to the present, to 2015, you see how many reds and orange and to some extent yellow spots are in the, uh, in, the, in the world. I go back and forth so you can visualize it again from here to here. And uh, so is no, what we need to notice is how much cities are growing and how so much of the global growth of urban life is taking place in Latin America, Asia, and Africa. So unsurprisingly, the interest of social science in uh, understanding cities of the global south or of development country is growing. And what you have is a proliferation of uh, approaches that try to 
understand the nature of urban life, the, the, the political and policy priorities for cities. And I want to illustrate that the clash between two approaches, the so-called post-colonial approach against the political economic approach to urban life. And I think the key is to understand that there are fundamental questions we have to ask ourselves or that we are even asking, even if we are not aware of it, when we ask the research questions of our work, when we design our research. So the first question is, does attention to diverging levels of development matter when we try to understand the urban experience across the world? What are the assumptions and standpoints that inform different research agendas and how do they affect the choices of the research methods that these researchers make? Finally, if you were to express your opinion after you've done this work, what are the distinctive traits, strengths and weaknesses of different theoretical approaches? So starting with the post-colonial narratives on the southern cities, uh, there is very recently uh, this idea that uh, um, we need to move away from sending the urban experience of cities in developing countries as chaos, as dystopia, and instead we need to understand uh, that these cities follow a different order. And that if we understand that, there is some very important hope that we can derive from the study of the city. So it's an attack to Eurocentric approaches to understanding cities as failure. The fact that uh, they look at Dar es Salaam in Tanzania or they look at Delhi in India and uh, approaches uh, of, uh, of a certain tradition tend to emphasize the things that don't work. The fact that these cities are cities as a policy failure. And they say, hold on a minute, we need to move away from materialistic explanation of urban life, center of failure, and we need to go beyond what they deem as an obsession to attentions to levels of development as the central entry point to understand cities. So a key scholar following this tradition says, every city is ordinary. Enough of calling Maputo uh, or Dar es Salaam or whatever city in the south as dysfunctional. Every city is ordinary. You just need to understand the different logic that each city has. Now compare this with the second approach we are reviewing here, which is the political economy approach. There is a scholar uh, called Mike Davis who wrote this book called Planet of Slums. And this uh, is a quite uh, anxiety driving read because he starts uh, explaining that what is historically unprecedented is the fact that for the first time we have over one billion people living in the slums of cities of the south in, and I quote, pollution, excrement, and decay. Why is that? Because they say these are cities without jobs, where the failure to create jobs for uh, the, uh, those who live in city or move to city looking for a better life creates what it calls a surplus humanity, a humanity that has no place in the economy of this place, absolutely uh, uh, unable to get a foot into the formal economy. So if you ask the same question as before, what is it that defines the nature of cities in cities of developing countries when you compare it to that of other parts of the world? The answer here would be we need to pay attention to different levels of uh, development because they do affect the le differences in levels of economic growth and income in these cities. A city which has no industry behind it will be unable to employ its population and that leads to the uh, uh, deprivation that is typical of slums life. And this level of development will have a, a profound impact on urban outcomes and on urban possibilities. So you can see it's a clash where the room for common ground is not there. What we need to do is therefore understand how is it that two different social scientists reach such a different conclusion when they look at cities of the global south. So we take this debate and we uh, have a two hour session exploring this debate. And then for the second week of this case study, remember each case study is taught over two weeks, you will take one of three books uh, of your choice, all available as an ebook in SOAS library. And you prepare uh, through independent reading 
uh, for the next week task, which is a uh, in class group work. So you have done your reading, you have done your notes, and you bring them to the classroom. And in the group, you will prepare a presentation outlining and critically assessing uh, three things the link between the evidence that the book presents, the research methods that he deploys to generate this evidence, and its theoretical contribution. So the key points that you need to bring to the class is what is the key argument of the book? What are its implications for development practice and intervention? So this is not just about theory, but trying to tease out the practical implication of theoretical approaches. Pull out the key quotes to really define the key arguments of the book. And then together with a strong sense of what the scholar is saying, you then need to come with your own argument. Do you agree with the argument of this book? If so, why? If not, why? And then you fit this to the group work and then you prepare a presentation. So this is a, a, a very brief taste of the kind of work that we do, the themes that cover, the linking of the thematic issue, in this case, the, the nature of urban life with the uh, research methods dimensions of this. What job prospects after the degree? You have quite a broad range of skills. You are trained in research methods, confident in the use of the main quantitative and qualitative research techniques. You are also uh, develop uh, an understanding through uh, the core courses and through the optional courses that you select of the main debates in international development. Uh, you are quite uh, fungible and uh, uh, flexible as a prospective employee because you have the thematic expertise about some debates, the main ones, but you also have a capacity to read these debates critically because you can explore how is it that a certain researcher reached that kind of conclusion? How does it square with the approach of another voice that has a very different take on this? So unsurprisingly, because they are flexible, because they come from a famous institution, we found that our graduates do very well in the labor market after graduation. Another thing is, if you are interested, I couldn't put you in touch with the, uh, our graduates, either the, and uh, you can get their feedback on their experience. We find that they tend to work in two sets of jobs, either as policy advisor and researchers in international development, working in the public governments of developing country, private or NGO third sector kind of institutions. And uh, for instance, there is a recent graduate that is now working in monitoring and evaluation in Mozambique or there are those who work as in the policy departments of organization. The second type of career avenue is that of further research, doctoral studies, either at so or in other universities. What we find is that you are a very well-trained prospective PhD students because, again, you have a strong training in research methods and design. So with the uh, training in research methods, you have the flexibility for your research project of deploying a number of methods rather than knowing just one. And then you also also have that work over research design. So this is in a nutshell uh, what I wanted to uh, give you. And now there is a time for uh, question and answers, which I think the best way is use the chat and uh, send to everyone uh, so that I can then reply, okay? You can also record messages in messages in this chat, maybe. No.
Okay, maybe I can uh, talk about the questions. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, so I got one from a young John Cheng. Will the school change any arrangement of the courses due to the coronavirus? We need to see how, of course, the, the, the situation changes from now to September. Uh, how it changes with the regard to the coronavirus emergencies and how it changes uh, with regard to our capacity to deliver. For the time being, we are offering this course as an on-campus only degree. Um, you can uh, take the MSc International Development online if you would like to study online, uh, but still with a SOAS degree. Uh, it might be that if the situation becomes clear to be a long term one, that there might be a push to make these and other degrees available online very quickly. Uh, and I can follow up th that with you. But for time, for the time being, you are uh, uh, offered this degree only online. OK. Uh, of course, if you want to know no more after I answer your question, just write again and I can follow up any unclear aspects. Now I have a question from Ruishi. Will the department organize extra development studies, talks, seminars delivered by external guests, politicians, NGO workers? Uh, absolutely. Uh, we do in a number of ways. We have a, a weekly uh, seminar uh, in uh, uh, international development, which is really world leading where outsiders and very rarely occasionally uh, our member staff present uh, cutting edge research uh, and is a, a, a very prestigious seminar series. On top of that, on top of that, there is the professional practice seminar that uh, brings uh, external speakers who work in international development practice uh, who talk about uh, their work and what can be learned from it for our students and the would-be development practitioners um, on a weekly basis. Do the curriculum and faculty also reflect the diversity source prides itself on? Absolutely. Uh, so the, the, the faculty in terms of members of staff is very diverse. Our uh, staff from India, from uh, uh, different parts of uh, uh, Europe, uh, from uh, uh, Africa, one member of staff. So he is as diverse as you will get a, a, a profile of member of staff. You can quickly uh, log in and look at our member of staff and you will get a sense of that. Uh, the, in terms of the curriculum, uh, it is uh, very diverse in a number of ways. First of all, it's uh, heterodoxy, is capacity to give space to radical critiques of international development. And then uh, there is also that uh, uh, element very big these days of uh, trying to decolonize the reading list and the curriculum in a way that uh, reflects uh, the current requests by students and staff worldwide. Uh, I have another question from Stoshi. Will we have a chance to conduct on the spot survey in developing countries? Um, not as part of uh, your compulsory uh, studies. What you do is uh, there is a dissertation and you need to uh, uh, agree with your supervisor a topic. Uh, as part of your uh, dissertation, some uh, students undertake fieldwork. Uh, uh, and uh, that would be uh, the scenario uh, that Satoshi is uh, uh, would be choosing if interested in carrying a survey. We need to be realistic about the time and how compressed is the time for a, a dissertation because you are finishing assignments, course exams uh, uh, at the latest early June or mid May, uh, and that uh, then you need to submit by September. So it is unlikely that you are able to do very large scale survey, but many students choose to do, or not many, a significant, but not mm, the majority of students choose to do field work for their dissertation. Another question from Ruishi, does SOAS offer any field trip opportunities? Uh, 
uh, we don't provide uh, that as part of our studies. Uh, we, um, if students undertake uh, fieldwork for their dissertation, they do so uh, by funding it, and there are very limited opportunities for fieldwork for that. But basically, the, the rule of thumb is that if you're doing fieldwork for your dissertation, you need to have the means to organize it. And often people who have connections in development link it with the interest of a, an organization that will then fund their studies and trip. Do we have another question from a uh, young Gao Cheng? Do we have our own academic advisors for our dissertations? Yes, you do. Uh, it works that uh, you are writing a dissertation proposal uh, that is handed in uh, in February. Uh, then we allocate supervisors, and then you are working with your supervisors uh, towards the development of your dissertation through a number of meetings. Uh, and they take place over the summer term with a, a certain deadline after which uh, no supervision is allowed. But each of you as a dedicated academic supervisor uh, that uh, deliver supervision for the dissertation development. I am now posing, leaving you time for uh, writing other questions if you have any. If you, on the other end, uh, uh, don't have any more questions, just let me know uh, and uh, we can uh, bring this to an end. No. Uh, do we have to defend our dissertation? Asks Sharaids. No. It is submitted and then marked by. Uh, your supervisor and uh, uh, another member of staff. But there's no Viva. Any other question? Yes, there is a question from Rui Rishi. Is this course a direct pathway to apply for PhD in International Development as SOAS? Yes, it is. So this course is available as an MSc uh, standalone, but is also available uh, for, I told you that is a ESRC funded. So as part of the ESRC funding, there are a, a number of studentships available every year and uh, um, pending uh, success in a competition for the scholarships and they have applications uh, that run every year in December, the preliminary round, and then in, uh, I think, uh, late January, uh, the uh, full application is invited if you have passed the preliminary round, and then we are deciding now for next year. So for next year, you have already missed the boat, uh, on funding, but every year, uh, if you are able to apply by December, the year before your studies, you can compete for uh, funding, and there are uh, places for the so called one plus three funding pathway where you do the first year the MSc research for international development and then you move uh, to a PhD in international development at SOAS. Uh, Rishi, can you clarify what is the minimum grade that you need to achieve for what? Ah, there's no, there's no uh, fixed rule, but it's a very competitive uh, process, the one for funding. So, uh, 
you, it's also not just about grades, it's about um, the statement, the proposed research, the match to the proposed supervisor, because when you apply for a one plus three uh, studentship, what you need to do is in the application, uh, put a two page proposal, research proposal, with a, also a, 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 a training plan, uh, which you need to work out with your prospective supervisor. So uh, we don't just look at grades. There are people who, who, who get funded uh, with a 2-1, there are people who get funded with a first, but it is a very competitive process. So the strongest the degree, uh, the more you are helping yourself in the competition a little bit. Any more questions? Thank you, Yang Gaocheng. Uh, if you have any other query, question, you can email me. Uh, and as you can see in the last slides, you just need to add my initials, uh, MR, Mr, like Mr. 3 at soas.ac.uk. So Mr. 3.ac.uk. So, Rishi, you're also good. You have any more questions? Okay, thank you very much for joining you. Uh, stay safe wherever you are. Uh, actually, uh, I haven't asked you what part is it with this meeting. Where are you based when you listen to this? Rish is in Durham. Shara is in the Netherlands, Hong Kong. And Satoshi is in Japan, Beijing, Beijing. Okay, so stay safe uh, wherever you are. And uh, if you have any other question, uh, just email me and I can try to answer it. Okay, bye, take care.